Hey, breakout students, this is going to be unit six, day three. And for day three, we're going to talk about what's called the natural exponent and see how it applies in natural exponential growth and decay models. So to generate what the natural exponent is, and I think that you will be familiar with this from Algebra 2 last year, we're going to look at this table of values that you see down below for the expression 1 plus 1 over n to the n. And what I want to do is I want to plug in 10 for n in both those spots. So like the first evaluation would be 1 plus 1 tenth to the tenth power. And then kind of really break this down and slowly plug in larger and larger values of n. So 100, 1,000, right? And kind of increase by a power of 10 each time and see how the value of this expression changes. So I think the easiest way to do this and the most efficient way would be if you go to your calculator and go to y equals, you can, for y1, type in 1 plus, I'm going to do a nice looking fraction here. Let's make it 1 over x raised to the x power. And then if you go to the table, what we want in our table is very specific values of x. We want when x is 10, 100, 1,000, and so on. So I'm going to go to second window, the table setup, and I'm going to switch the independent over to ask. So that when I go to my table, it should be blank. And I can type in things like, hey, x equals 10. You can see that the y value there is 2.594. I'll go to the nearest thousandths place. So 2.594 is what we get. And for 10 squared, you don't even have to know the values there. You can type in 10 squared as your value of x. It will calculate um, and know that it's 100 there, but we get 2.705 to the thousands place. So notice how plugging in a much larger value, we went from 10 to 100. There's not that big of a change in the overall value of my decimal here. Uh, well, maybe we'll get a big change if we type in 10 cubed, which is 1,000. Huh, still not a big change there, 2.717. And even though we have a super large exponent we're creating here of 1,000, we're only adding on 1 1,000th to 1. So that's why we're not seeing maybe as big of a change as we expected. So film the rest of the table there. I'm going to go ahead and, and do mine pretty quickly over here. So we get 10 to the 4th, 10 to the 5th, and then 10 to the 6th. So we get 2.718, and then 2.718, and then 2, well, <laughs> it's not changing to the thousandths place when I write down the next three. 2.718, 2.718, 2.718. 2 do the values in the table appear to be approaching a fixed decimal number? Well, I think they do. If so, what is the number rounded to three decimal places? It is 2.718. So the conclusions that I want us to be able to make here is that as n gets larger and larger and larger, so the concept here is as n goes to infinity, the expression 1 plus 1 over n to the n power is getting closer and closer and closer to this value 2.718 approximately. And because it's approaching this special value, this is actually known in math as the natural exponent. And the natural exponent is denoted by E. So if you go to your calculator right now, I'm going to get out of my table here. If you look and you hit second division sign, second division, a little E will pop up on your calculator. And if you hit enter, it will tell you 2.718 rounded to three decimal places. Now, don't let the decimals that follow after that fool you at all, because I'll tell you E is irrational. you know, kind of like the very famous irrational number pi. So it's a decimal that doesn't end, doesn't repeat. And this natural exponent is used in examples of maybe population growth. When we say a population grows naturally, we would actually use a base E exponential model to represent that. We'll see E used in other contexts as well, including financial applications. So we'll see that in a few minutes. But before we get into it, because we know a little bit about exponential functions, we want to graph you know, something of the form a times e to the x minus h plus k, just kind of bringing back some transformations of functions. So what would e to the x look like? Well, e to the x would look something like this. It's going to be exponential growth because, of course, we have a base of the exponential that's about 2.718. So for comparison purposes, if you were to graph, let's say, 2 to the x and, and 3 to the x with it, 3 to the x would be 
steeper on the positive side, but it would it would decay faster on the negative side. So three to the X might be something like that. Whereas two to the X would not grow as fast as E to the X, but it would be slightly above the function E to the X on the negative side, because that base of E is you know, somewhere between two and three. This is what we might expect the graph to look like, but notice how they still all have that same Y intercept at zero one. So in thinking about function transformations that we can apply to the parent E to the X, two times E to the negative X, when you negate the X in the exponent, that's going to first and foremost reflect over the Y axis. Negating X flips it over Y. And then in step two, the two on the outside is gonna be a vertical stretch of the graph. So we're gonna double the Y values after we flip it over the Y axis. So maybe I'll just take my base model over here and say if that's e to the x, reflecting over the y-axis is gonna make it look like this. Okay, so that's kind of the first transformation. And then from there, we're gonna double the y-values, which is gonna make it grow a little bit faster here, right? So it's gonna stretch the graph out as compared to just having e to the negative x. Just rough sketches, not a huge deal as far as accuracy, but I should be able to look at that and and be able to see some of the transformations that occurred to the parent. Looking at example three, e to the x plus two minus three, well, there's two things that have happened there as well. When the exponent is x plus two, we're gonna shift this graph to the left two, minus three is gonna move it down three. What I didn't address up here, which is kind of important in terms of exponentials, is that it would also have for the parent function a horizontal at y equals zero. So taking that graph and moving it down three units, now we have a horizontal asymptote at y equals negative three. We're also gonna move this graph to the left too. So if you wanna kind of plot even just one point for accuracy purposes, the y-intercept was at zero, one to start on the parent, it's gonna go left two, and then it's gonna go down three. So it's actually the point negative two, negative two is on this graph. Okay, if I wanted to find the y-intercept, it's not a nice value, is it? It's gonna be, if I plug in zero for x, you know, e squared minus three, whatever that is. Okay, it's some positive amount, but if you were to sketch the graph, you're gonna get something that looks like this, okay? So just in terms of thinking about trying to be somewhat accurate, this point is sufficient enough to say, all right, as long as we know we have a positive y-intercept, don't cross on the negative side, you know, over here. I think we're we're good to go as far as that's concerned. Okay, so if we're good with that, let's flip it over to the back, page two of the packet. By the way, if you haven't realized we're in the packet, I probably should have mentioned that to start. That was on page one of the packet. All right, page two, modeling natural exponential growth and decay. This I'm thinking is gonna sound familiar to you from last year when interest is compounded continuously. That's the key word continuously compounded interest is going to be modeled using the formula A equals the end amount. It's gonna be P times E to the RT power. Very affectionately and fondly known as the PERT formula. So we're still gonna have an initial amount, but when interest is compounded continuously, we're gonna have that a base E is a good model for the base of the exponential in this PERT formula. Okay, and that's raised to the RT power. And if you were to take a calculus course, you would, I, I would say dive a little bit deeper into how we can develop this formula. But for now, I think you'll trust me to say, all right, if I take this equation and apply this example that, I don't know if we did this yesterday, but we'll apply it right now. Suppose $1,000 is invested at an annual rate of 8% compounded continuously. We have to read that very carefully to know all right, we know compounded monthly, compounded quarterly, compounded daily would be the other compound interests, right? That's this one, P times one plus R over N to the NT. But when compounding continuously, I can't plug in infinity is what really the concept is. You can't plug in infinity for N. So since we know one plus one over N to the N is E as N gets larger and larger and larger, we can use this as an approximation for the equation when interest is compounded continuously. Find the total amount in the account after 10 years if no withdrawals are made. So the amount after 10 years would be the initial investment of 1,000 times e to the, the rate, just make sure you do that as a decimal, 0 0.08 times 
10. So the amount in the account is, let's see if we can plug this in pretty easily here, 1,000. Second division sign is that E again, E to the 0 0.08 times 10 is $2,225.54. So $2,225.54. Not bad for not doing anything to the money. More than doubles in 10 years. Okay, how long before the account grows to $3,000? Solve graphically. There will be ways in this course that we learn how to do this algebraically at some point, but for now, the easiest way for us to accomplish this is to figure out how much time, so how long would be, what's T, when the amount in the account is 3,000. So going back to this equation, we know the end amount, we know the initial amount. We know the rate, but we're looking for the time. So we got 3,000 is equal to 1,000 e to the 0 0.08 t. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do good old graphically, y1, y2. We're gonna calculate the intersection. Okay, see what happens here. So let's take a look at y equals, and I'm gonna type in 1000 e, oops, not division, second division, to the 0 0.08 x into y1. And y2, I'm gonna type in 3000. And before I hit graph, we have to think really carefully about, first of all, y2 equaling 3,000, that's gonna be a horizontal line at y equals 3,000. The exponential model with that base of e, it's gonna look something like this, okay? And we wanna figure out how much time it takes for those two things to cross. Okay, so in order to do that, I'm gonna have to go to my window and make my y max at least as high as 3000. That's what the line I wanna see up here. I'm gonna change it to, to 3500, just to give myself a little bit of a margin at the top there so I don't have to like squint to see the line y equals 3000. I'm gonna go a little bit higher than that. Okay, in terms of the x axis, what does x represent? X is time, that's what I'm solving for. I wanna know how much time does it take for the amount, the y value, to reach 3000. Well, we can cheat a little bit, and that's not really cheating, but it's being smart. We know that 10 years later from the last question that the amount is $2,225, which is not quite 3,000 yet. So if I'm looking for how much time it takes for the amount to grow to $2,000 or to $3,000, I know I need to go out further than 10 years. It's not gonna happen by then. And by the way, if you wanna make the x min zero, it's, you're certainly okay to do that. I think if I double that, that should be fine and make an X max of 20 here. And according to these constraints, that's all looking like it makes sense. Okay, I actually have my calculator in simultaneous mode, which is graphing them both at once. You might have just one graph at a time, but that's pretty much what I sketched here, isn't it? Here's my two graphs. So based on that, I can do second trace, calculate the intersection, choice five. Scroll near that point of intersection, hit enter once, twice, three times. And it didn't say where to round it, how long. I'll go to the hundredth of a year, why not? So the time that it takes is 13.73 years. Okay, so almost 13 and, and three quarters of a year later, that's when we would expect the account to reach $3,000 in total. Okay. Last thing we'll do is this question here, we're gonna start with $5,000. So a higher initial investment. We still have 8% interest compounded continuously, but we're only doing this for five years. Okay, so same interest rate as above, still compounded continuously, but we wanna know what's the total in the account after five years, assuming no withdrawals. By the way, even if I don't say that, that's always the assumption we're gonna make in these questions. So the amount would be 5,000 times E to the rate 0.08 times the time of five years, and let's see what that comes out to be. So 5,000. Um, if you do second LN, by the way, LN is next to four down here, it does e to a power already for you, so that might be a good little shortcut as well. Or you can just keep going with second division sign and do the exponent on your own. 5,000 e to the 0 0.08, but now times five, and that's $7,459 and 12 cents. So five years later, you know, we have almost $2,500 in interest that we've earned on the account. Okay, 
So the question is how long before it doubles and how long before it triples? I'll just do the doubles with you just to make sure we're okay with the graphical solution here. And then I'll let you try the triples. So triples, try it right in this space right over here. Okay, but for doubles, what are we looking for? Well, the initial investment was 5,000. So I wanna know when does it double to reach 10,000? So that's gonna be 5,000 e to the 0.08x. I don't know how much time it takes. That's what we're solving for. So we gotta do y1, y2 again. And we'll also think about adjusting the window to make sure we see that point of intersection. So in y equals, I need 5,000. Actually, everything else is the same, right? E to the 0.08x, so that was a quick fix. In y2, I'm gonna type in the double value, 10,000. I know already I'm gonna to have to adjust the y max to be more than 10,000. I'll go up to 11,000. Oops, I don't need 110,000. Okay, x max of 20, I think I'm pretty confident it will happen before 20 years is up. In five years, we're at this amount, so by 20 years, will we be at 10,000? That seems pretty likely. If I hit graph, let's see. Yeah, it's definitely gonna happen before 20 years is up. So once that's done graphing, I'll calculate the intersection. So we've got second trace, option five. And where am I? I'm too high, oh, there we are. Okay, so there's my cursor, hit enter three times, and it takes 8.66 years for this to happen. So according to the intersection, time is 8.66 years. Okay, so like I said, you guys try the triple over here and that's actually it for this lesson. So a little bit with the concept of what base E is all about, the natural exponent, and how we can apply it in financial applications with the PERC formula. Tomorrow we'll see some more applications with E in some population growth and decay. But other than that, have